Welcome Caltech alumni and friends to today's conversation with Caltech's 2021 Distinguished Alumna, President Lori Leshen. Your host today, I'm Sandra Tsing Lo, a fellow or sister, or I guess we call it sibling Caltech alumna, BS in physics. 1983, Page House, also a dis Caltech distinguishing, see, I can't even say it. I, my family was such in shock when I got it. Also a Caltech distinguished alumna from 2021 and host since 2004 of the syndicated KPCC NPR radio podcast, The Lowdown on Science, your daily mid a day of science invented by the best alma mater of all, Caltech. Quick moment of housekeeping. This fast moving hour has three parts. First, President Thomas Rosenbaum will give his introduction. Then President Lushin and I will have a conversation around Leshen around 30 minutes. A little after that, Lori will be on first name basis by then. We'll take your questions. Thanks to those who've already submitted. Those are great ones. You can also submit your questions in real time. How to do it? Just submit them via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please include your affiliation with Caltech. We'll submitting your questions so we can give a nice shout out to you amidst family. Today's conversation will be recorded and made available online following the event. And so without further, to, in, in, uh, without further ado to introduce our distinguished alumna, President Lori Leshen, it is my huge pleasure and honor to welcome Thomas Rosenbaum, President of Caltech. Thank you, Sandra, and welcome to all for this special conversation. Uh, Caltech's Distinguished Alumni Award is the highest honor the Institute bestows upon a graduate. It was initiated in 1966 to recognize the outstanding achievements of our alumni, whose leadership in fundamental discovery, technological innovation, and societal impact exemplifies the essence of their Caltech training. The Institute's contributions to the world emanate in large part from the accomplishments of its graduates. And today, we celebrate the work and vision of Caltech Geochemistry PhD and 2021 Distinguished Alumna, Lori Leshen. Dr. Leshen's career has been marked by a series of leadership positions where she has inspired students and shaped large institutions, always informed by her love of scientific discovery. After undergraduate study at Arizona State University and graduate work at Caltech, Dr. Leshen embarked on her academic career at UCLA's Department of Earth and Space Science. In 1996, during her time at UCLA, she was the inaugural recipient of the Meteoritical Society's Near Prize which recognizes outstanding research in meteoritics or planetary science by a scientist under the age of 35. In 1998, Dr. Leshen returned to Arizona State, serving as director of the Center for Meteorite Studies, home of the largest university-based meteorite collection in the world, and led the development of ASU's interdisciplinary School of Earth and Space Exploration. Her research, which focuses on understanding the record of water and objects in the solar system, includes studying meteorites from Mars to assess the planet's history of water and its potential for life. In recognition of her contributions to planetary science, the International Astronomical Union named an asteroid after her, 4922 Leshen. How cool is that? During her time at ASU, she was appointed by President Bush to serve on the Commission for the Implementation of U.S. Space Exploration Policy. This led to a move to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center as Director of the Sciences and Exploration Directorate and Deputy Center Director for Science and Technology. There, she was a member of two science teams on the Mars Science Laboratory mission, running experiments on board MSL's Curiosity rover which is still exploring outcrops on the Red Planet. From Goddard, it was a small leap in 2011 to become the Deputy Associate Administrator for NASA's Exploration Systems Mission Directorate, where Dr. Leshen provided oversight for NASA's future human spaceflight programs. After a sojourn at RPI as the Dean of the School of Science, Dr. Leshen moved to Worcester Polytechnic Institute to become its 16th and its first female president. 
WPI now stands as a beacon of diversity, equity, and inclusion with one of the highest percentage of undergraduate women in STEM. In the last several years, WPI has created the Center for Project-Based Learning, which supports other universities as they adopt the high-impact educational practice of project-based learning long embedded in WPI's curriculum. Through this center, WPI has helped more than 110 higher education institutions, comprising approximately 1 million students. During a lecture in 2016, Dr. Leshen recounted seeing the first photos of the Martian surface in Time magazine as a 10-year-old, an event that helped spark her interest in STEM and set the stage for her career. Quote, my first space memory was Viking 1 landing on Mars in 1976. And I remember seeing that picture and just want to reach out and touch those rocks. And just thinking it was the most amazing thing in the world that humans could build this machine and explore this other world. It inspired me, this deep-seated realization that adults could do amazing things if they put their minds to it. We honor Dr. Lori Leshen for her own realization of amazing things, from barrier-breaking leadership to her accomplishments as a distinguished geochemist and space scientist. And now, back to our magnificent moderator, Sandra Singh Lo. Thank you so much. What a, what a great intro. And welcome, President Leshen. Thank you, Sandra and Tom. Wow, thank you so much for that incredible intro. I'm glad my camera was off while he was reading it. That was uh, that was lovely. So before, and I'll, I'll call you Lori now, if I may, uh, before going into your amazing career and accomplishments um, in adulthood, I wonder if we could step back to your childhood for a moment. And yes, uh, 1976, Time Magazine, that was a moment where you saw those amazing photos, but what, I, was there even an earlier moment, perhaps, which, which where you first caught your scientific curiosity? Absolutely. I, I've always been fascinated by the outdoors and spent a lot of time in the outdoors as a child and in a large part, actually, thanks to my dad, Steve Leshen, who's actually here uh, with us today, which is wonderful. Um, thanks, dad. And uh, he, he would take us on a lot of camping trips and outings and things like that. And, and you know, we moved to Arizona when I was eight. And, uh, and I, I distinctly remember our first trip to the Grand Canyon um, and seeing just the absolute incredible, beautiful layers and just the awe-inspiring landscape. It was amazing standing on the edge. And I, I always remember turning around and, and there was a sign there that said, please don't take rocks from the Grand Canyon. And my dad said, see, that's how the Grand Canyon formed. Everyone came, took a rock, and there you go. And ha ha ha. But, <laughs> But I remember at the time thinking, I don't think that's right. <laughs> and so I was already kind of testing hypotheses about the natural world at that point. Um, but growing up in that beautiful Arizona landscape was certainly a, a big part of what inspired me to um, and connected me so strongly to those early Mars photographs from the Viking mission that President Rosenbaum mentioned, I did. I just wanted to reach out and touch those rocks. And um, and, and it was an incredibly inspiring thing. But, but honestly, it, it made me fascinated about space. But I wasn't one of those people that from that moment on, I knew I was going to be a space scientist. That wasn't the case. I just thought it was incredible and fascinating and, and stuck with me all these years. And that is such a, you know, transitioning into the moment where you decide STEM can be a career. Uh, we're going to intermix a couple of your questions that we got just because I think it's fun. And we have a star STEM teacher in Westminster High, Hui Fam, who has asked, which dovetails perfectly in your story. And he's watching with the, I think, girls in STEM right now. Shout out. Um, what started your journey into STEM, he asked. What advice would you give your high school self? So I think take us to high school, if you will. And yeah. what, what happens then? 
in terms of yeah and, and look i think there's a lot of data that shows that it especially for girls can be hard to sort of keep that love of stem alive and i just thank so much the amazing i always call stem teachers in middle school and high school like major heroes they are incredible at at um at working to keep all students interest in stem and it's by the way not only girls that that fall off as they get into high school but but boys interest falls off too just not as much uh, and so we've got a lot of work to do to make continue to make STEM engaging, but it's things like finding things that uh, that you're passionate about and that that get you excited that are related to STEM. And these days, almost everything has some connection to STEM. And so working to really find what it is for you. And for me, you know, having a couple of really great teachers, a great physics teacher, a fantastic chemistry teacher who, you know, I loved the labs. I loved the hands-on stuff. I loved you know, experimenting and gathering information and trying to figure out, solve a puzzle. And, and to me, it was always just uh, a really exciting thing to do. And so whatever it is, whether it's building robots or studying rocks or, you know, dissecting frogs, which is never my thing, the biology stuff was always my interest, but some people loved it, you know, find that thing and, and keep pursuing it. And, and to all of the, the teachers out there who are working to make uh, this bring this next generation forward, you know, thank you for the work that they do. And, um, but what made you think, so you, that, that engendered your love of chemistry, that, that right. great teacher, I, I believe, um, but then your introduction to NASA pretty early, when, when did that happen? Yeah, and, you know, the great teacher theme kind of, kind of continues with me, and oh, by the way, I mean, that's something that I think almost every successful scientist has in common, is they can, look back on finding that person who they connected with that it's so critical as a college president. Now I talk to faculty all the time about their ability to train, change the trajectory of a young person's life. And that's what happened to me in college. I did have a great freshman chem professor, uh, George Wittenberg. I still remember him. He was, he was amazing. Uh, who, who made again, chemistry super accessible and fun. And I ended up declaring chemistry, thinking about a lot of different sciences that I might want to major in, but you know, I hadn't had much exposure to, to geology in high school, not a lot of people do. And so I was head, headed on the, the chemistry path, but I was um, lucky to see as a sophomore at Arizona State posted on the bulletin board, a summer internship at NASA. It's actually at a place called the Lunar and Planetary Institute that sits right next to Johnson Space Center in Houston. And I hadn't missed the deadline and you didn't have to be a graduating senior. I was 19, I was a sophomore at the time. And it had on it all these potential areas of research like interplanetary dust particles and lunar cratering history and all of these things that I could tell what the individual words were, but I didn't know what they meant when you put them all together. And so I did something, I, I, I sort of had this little moment of courage and I talk about this a lot of the importance of just having a small moment of courage every now and then to, to step into something that is unknown. And so I, I literally pulled the whole advertisement. There's only one application on it. I pulled it off the wall and I went and I cold called, knocked on her door, having never met her before. Um, the only woman full professor in the sciences at ASU at that time and in, in the physical sciences, a woman named Sue Wyckoff and said, you know, you don't really know me, but I saw this on the wall. I really don't have any idea what it means, but could you help me? And I can still to this day see her sitting in her office, literally dropping what she was doing and saying, sure, come in, sit down, let's talk. And it's a, it's a longer story than this about, you know, we spent half an hour together. She ends up picking up the phone and calling someone to see if she knows anybody there. Turns out she totally knew the guy who was in charge and yada, yada. So long story short, I ended up getting the summer internship at NASA, but just the fact that she didn't say I'm too busy, that she had her door open, that she, you know, that she was willing to talk to a student. And this, these stories happen every day, all the time. This is the life-changing power of being a faculty member. And, uh, and by the way, it's what most faculty members live for, for all those students out there who are too afraid to go see their professor. Like this is the kind of thing that can happen. So anyway, so I got to go and spend 10 weeks at NASA in the summer of 1985. This was the heyday of the shuttle program um, before the Challenger disaster. Uh, and I got to work on data. I did my first research there, working on data from the Viking mission, actually that same mission that had so inspired me as a young person. Uh, this was the Viking orbiters actually built by JPL, which uh, is, it was amazing. And, 
And I was hooked. It was like the lightning bolt had struck. That was it. I knew what I wanted to do from there out is, is do research and, uh, and study the planets. So now in, in grad school, you come to Caltech. So we always like to ask what was like, what drew you to Caltech and what was it like landing not on Mars, but on the Caltech campus? What, what, yeah. what did that feel like for you? What did that look like? coming from it's, such a large university. Also. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a big culture shock to go from Arizona State, you know, still one of the top five largest universities in the country was even back then, way, way back then, uh, to, to Caltech. Uh, and I just remember sort of saying, where is everybody? And people saying, oh, this is everybody. <laughs> and, uh, and, and just the, the, the smallness, you know, the commute, the small community showed up in some very uh, tangible ways for me. I, because I had been a chemist as an undergrad and I stuck with that, I started, you know, moving towards geochemistry, this sort of melding of geoscience and, and chemical sciences. But um, when I came to Caltech, I was in the division of geological and planetary sciences in the geochemistry concentration, but it meant I hadn't taken most, you know, hardly any undergraduate geoscience courses. And so I had to take a bunch of undergraduate courses at Caltech. Um, and the one I always talk about and remember is that I, I had to take optical mineralogy with Professor George Rossman, who's still on the faculty at Caltech. I got to see him a few weeks ago when I was there for the DAA award. Um, and uh, I was the only student in that class. So that would never happen at Arizona State. <laughs> I was the only student. And, and I, I like to joke that, it, you know, it's not like you can blow off your reading when you're the only student in the class. Not that I would ever blow off my reading. But, uh, but I have to say, I, I hate to interrupt, but that is such a uniquely Caltech memory that many of us have to be either the one student or one of three. I mean, it was really, it's very specific and many yeah. of us. That and I was, well. you know, I was there I, when I was back on campus a few weeks ago, uh, you know, so I have these vivid memories of stepping up to the chalkboard and we would meet in, in his office and he would say, you know, go up and derive the optical indicatrix of blah, blah, blah. So I was there a few weeks ago and I sort of wandered up to the third floor of arms and there he was in his office and we just had a great chat and he said, do you want to see the labs? And he showed me around and there's this beautiful rock slab on one of the walls that they've now put up. And he says, steps back and says, can you identify some minerals? <laughs> I was just immediately oh. transported right back. Anyway, yeah, so he's, uh, he's an amazing, amazing teacher. Hilarious, hilarious. Well, you, I, I believe, were you, were you not uh, in North Mud at that time? Oh so, yeah, my office was in Arms and my lab on the third floor of Arms and my lab was in the basement of North Mud. I worked with Ed Stolper was my, my main advisor, but also Sam Epstein. I was Sam's last student. Um, he passed away in uh, 2001, but uh, was really father of, of stabilized stove geochemistry, just a, a truly extraordinary human being. And um, yes, and so my, my lab was, I call it my lab under the stairs in the basement of North Mud. Was it really like a Harry Potter closet? Like what did it look like, Harry Potter closet? What yeah, so it's a bit like a walk-in closet. It was, um, so what I was doing um, for my PhD research is uh, taking pieces of Martian meteorites. So we can talk more later if you want, but we have these meteorites that we think were blasted off the surface of Mars and have fallen to earth since we haven't gone to Mars yet and picked up some stuff and brought it back. These are our best uh, samples of Mars that we have and they're fascinating rocks actually. But we were trying to understand water on Mars. And so we would take these rocks and we were heating them up and extracting volatiles, water and CO2 that were released and then analyzing their isotopic composition. I would sort of extract the water in this little lab under the stairs and then um, go down the hall to one of the oldest mass spectrometers on the planet and, and run it on through. And the whole thing was, um, it was amazing actually. I mean, I, I, I talk about this, this time in my life all the time. It was, it was both an incredible scientific experience, just being in that little lab under the stairs with I think there was a window, but it was kind of blocked off. Tiny little lab. The ceiling was sloped because it was under the stairs. And I probably spent five years of my life in that, in that lab, heating up pieces of meteorite and extracting the water and, and like trying to learn about water on Mars. And, and it was great. And then we would go to conferences and talk about, about the results. And um, 
and we'd sort of fight it out. There were like two dozen people, scientists in the world who were studying these meteorites. It was not a very big community. And we'd go to the conferences and sort of be fighting it out and fascinating. And then, and then sort of fast forward, um, when I was a postdoc at UCLA, I got a call from a reporter who said, and this was on oh, August 8th, 1996, uh, saying, hey, a paper's gonna be published tomorrow about these meteorites that you studied, um, saying that they think one of them has fossils in it. And that they're, this is evidence of life on Mars. What do you think? And I just remember thinking, well, I, I sort of said, I don't know. I haven't seen the paper. I couldn't possibly comment. You know, I did a sort of good scientist thing. Don't talk about stuff you don't know about. Um, and literally the next day, I hung up the phone and I thought, well, I wonder if there'll be a few more people at the next conference, right? And the next day, it was literally the front page of every paper. I swear, if you go and look up newspapers on August 9th, I think, 1996, you will see life on Mars on every paper. Um, President Clinton gave a speech about the little meteorites that I was studied alone in the lab under the stairs for five years with nobody else and the two dozen people around the world and talking about how important this discovery might be and that we need to follow up and nobody, you know, we're not sure yet. And at the, le and at the next scientific conference, there were a thousand people in the room, including a lot of reporters and including me up at the front saying, yeah, maybe not so much with the fossil thing, but that's a whole other story, but it just, you know, it, it is amazing to me, and it was such an eye-opening experience about how the work of small groups of scientists or individual scientists who toil away for years in little labs under the stairs can spark people's imaginations. And I actually think in some ways that whole experience of the life in the Martian meteorite discussion and just watching how it, it changed the Mars exploration program. I got sucked down to JPL for the first time intensively to um, help replan Mars explorations. The first time I met a NASA administrator was a few days after that when we had made all these plans and we flew to Washington to pitch Mars sample return not for the first time, but for the first time in the modern era. Um, and it totally changed the Mars exploration program, our, our program of spacecraft going to explore Mars. It's amazing the work of individual scientists, how it can really feed people's imaginations and, and change the direction of scientific inquiry. That was maybe a longer answer than you were hoping for. No, no, and it, it really um, told the story of the arc of, of science and science and science communication yeah. of how, how amazing and, and the world's um, imagination gets inspired. It, it really can, there's really a conversation between science and the public around that. Um, so in 2004, you yeah. served on President Bush's Commission on Implementation of United States Space Exploration Policy. This rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have to keep looking down at my face. used to call it the, the Moon, Mars and Beyond Commission. That's oh, was, see, that was a short science communicator, moon, Mars and beyond. That's so much better than whatever I was just trying to say. It so, doesn't even have a good acronym. Yeah. I, <laughs> moon. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. OK, so uh, if, if you could take our viewers back to 2004 in terms of there you are on this, you know, yeah. commission, sort of debating, describing, exploring, trying to articulate what space travel is going to be from 2004 beyond. Can you give us a little context of what that looked like then yeah. and what your ideas were going forward. Yeah, and actually, I mean, it's a good next step after what I was just talking about as being sort of the thing that gives you a broader view. This was another experience for me that that was really significant just personally in, in going from that sort of individual scientist view of the world to having this broader view that probably, again, led me out of the lab and into the leadership roles that I've been fortunate um, to have. And uh, so this was in the wake of the Columbia disaster, the Columbia orbit Earth loss in 2003 on reentry. And uh, what we realized then was in pretty short order, we were going to need to retire the space shuttle and think more about what comes next. And, and so this commission was put together, it was the first time in history that a president had come to NASA headquarters and given a speech. Pre the second president Bush did that. And during the speech, he actually pointed into the audience and said, I'm, I'm putting a commission together and I've asked Pete Aldridge to uh, run that commission. And I remember at the time, a bunch of us professors had gathered at ASU to watch the speech. It was a big deal having the president speak at NASA. Um, and I remember at the time thinking, wow, that would be really cool to get to do that. And in the end, they did ask me to be a part of it. I was the youngest of the nine people on the commission, got to serve with great folks like Maria Zuber, who's now co-chair of PCAST, um, 
Carly Fiorino when she was CEO of Hewlett Packard and and several other really um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was was on the commission with us so that was good to become good friends with him but a couple of the folks and and uh, Pete Aldridge is one and and a guy named Michael Jackson is another who had really worked in different sectors public sector private sector you know for profit not for profit had all of this experience and for me personally it um it made me feel the ivory tower for the first time and i can come back and talk a little bit more about what the commission found but just sort of speaking personally um i had always worked in higher ed except those 10 weeks when i was 19 when i worked at nasa um i had always worked in, i literally my first job at, in high school at 16 was working in the registrar's office answering phones at my local university right and so this idea of broadening our experience to see how other kinds of organizations work was sort of planted with me during that and and the Commission did a very quick work four months had uh, hearings all over the country and made um, recommendations around. Um, kind of how to help NASA think differently and move forward as they move beyond having humans only going a few hundred miles up and going round and round the earth really positioning NASA to be on the frontier with human spaceflight, as they are in science, by the way, in space science already. And so, and then talking a lot about the partnership between science and human spaceflight. It was, um, it set the stage for the creation of the human spaceflight programs that would come next and caused NASA afterwards to give me a call to say, why don't you think about coming and not just throwing these recommendations over the transom, but perhaps helping us implement some of them. So you talked about the ivory tower for a moment, which is a great pivot into uh, next topic. I'm going to conflate. And again, thanks for the great questions that our viewers are putting in. We're going to try to at least shout out to them. We won't get to all of the ones that we have, but certainly um, a viewer, I want to say, we like to give shout outs, Mike Flanagan, MS91 Electrical Engineering, PhD 95 Electrical Engineering. So I'm going to conflate a couple of questions together and you can answer how you will. He asked, what is the biggest challenge facing universities today? Do IWISCOM Live has so kind of worked at Goddard for 30 years, mm. taught as an adjunct at University of uh, MD, which What's MD? I'm from California. Maryland. So. Maryland. Thank you. <laughs> My a, lot of, a lot of connections between Maryland and Goddard. Yeah. And um, and and sometimes professors, and this may be uh, in atmospheric science, would complain about increasing math phobia amongst their students. Well, I don't know if you see that. Yeah. Um, MIT and Caltech fellows loved math. Like, and and I think, of course, now you're the leader of this great really esteemed university. Um, what do you what do you see in terms of the past, present, and future of STEM, if you will, to answer. Yeah, that. so several things. I mean, look, I do think we've, we're have we suffering as a country from having failed a lot of our students in, in their foundational education, um, especially around mathematics and science, and that we need to, you know, great teachers like those we were talking about earlier need to do their best to, to keep up the work with, with students. And look, I think we need to um, think hard about the resources we're willing to put into public education in this country because we need more personalized approaches. We it just the resources we have, I think, really in many ways only allow us to kind of go with the big class and kind of do our best to optimize across a larger group. But the great thing about technology is I think there are many opportunities now to incorporate approaches and technologies that can help personalize, especially math education. We have to be aiming not for just getting students through, but for mastery. And, and in order to do that, we also need to come up with some more fun ways to teach and learn math. I think this is also critically important, which is where experiential learning comes in. You know, if you're building a robot in a robot competition, this is way more fun than doing, you know, repeating a hundred math problem kind of homework. And, and again, are there, we have to use all of our creativity to think about ways to engage students and help them see how math and science are playing into the everyday things that they're fascinated by. So there's that whole piece and, and STEM education at the collegiate level, I think to me, the thing that I see that really motivates our students is make an impact on the world. It's, it's about how do I use STEM for good? How do I use STEM to improve lives? How do I 
translate knowledge to action. And increasingly, again, for us at WPI, that's really about if you want to if you want to teach students how to make an impact in the world, you have to teach they have to do that during their time as students. They actually have to learn by doing. And so that's really where experiential learning becomes so critically important. Um, at WPI, we send our students to project centers all over the world in teams with faculty to work with local sponsors on problems that sit at the intersection of technology and society. So they actually solve real world problems while they're here as students. And when you see a student get plopped into another country with you know all of the cultural challenges that that entails and so, and really help local a local community grapple with a challenging problem the confidence and the excitement that that generates like you can't you can't bottle that you can't you can't teach that in a lecture it's really something that can only be experienced and so i i truly believe that the future of stem education is more experiential and i'll just say one other thing the future of STEM is more than STEM. And again, I'm not a big fan of like changing the acronyms and steaming and whatever else we're doing, but, but in order for STEM professionals to make the kind of impact that we know they want to make, they need to be multidisciplinary within STEM. There, you know, no single, um, no single discipline is enough and they need to be able to not only work across STEM disciplines, but integrate human skills global competencies, business skills in many cases to make an impact uh, creating value in the business world. And so again, thinking much more holistically about um, students' pathways through a STEM education, which again, all of that it leads to much more personalization, right? Which is labor intensive and can be expensive. And so that's, that's the big challenge, right? Um, we've gotta be willing to put the resources behind making sure that everybody has access to the kinds of, of STEM education that we know we can we can deliver. And, and by the way, the future of the country depends on it. So just to be clear, right? Um, we, we uh, you know, future innovators are, are exactly what we need more of right now, not less. Yeah, and I know at WPI, you're lowering financial barriers for students to participate. Yeah. You've talked about having a STEM community that looks more like the U.S. Um, yeah. I wonder if you could hold up the coffee mug I saw earlier. In the <laughs> yeah, here's my, yeah, no, it's Devonest mug. Yeah, that's my coffee mug. Um, and, uh, right, and those mugs, and you, you gifted one of those, did you not? <laughs> I was telling Sandra, yeah, I, uh, we gave one of these to uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We, we had an event a few years ago at the Supreme Court with attorneys who were WPI alums getting inaugurated into the um, Supreme Court bar. And uh, and we had written to Justice Ginsburg to join us at a reception afterwards and she came and she was just amazing. She absolutely, absolutely loved it. And, and you know, also sort of uh, in honor of my own mom who was, uh, who pe just passed away this past summer, but who was, uh, an incre she was not a scientist herself, but she was incredibly encouraging of me to pursue passion in STEM. And she was uh, a feminist who was always out there rattling cages and back in the seventies, you know, member of now and uh, advocating on behalf of the equal rights amendment. And I, I know that she was doing that so that, that I could do this. Okay, so um, back before I go to um, some viewer questions, um, so space travel 2021 and beyond, Mars, uh, new things with Mars, John Whitehead asks, um, do you still follow progress towards Mars sample return? Should we expect to receive samples on schedule 2031? So what do you see and what excites you in terms of space travel? Mander, oh, or personed or unpersoned, or things that you're curious about with Mars space, what excites yes. you these days about this? so much so you know i've got my i've got my two favorite planets right here um and actually i don't know if this will work yes turn oh so there's my mars pictures on the wall all different uh, mars landscapes there and i you can't see it I, i'll mess it up if i try and pick it up but right over my head here is uh the first selfie that curiosity took when she after she uh landed on mars and had been exploring for the first few days and that's looks like pictures of arizona yeah, it, it totally does. And again, that's why I love it. You know, I, um, 
yeah, my, Sedona, Arizona is one of my favorite places on earth. And there's a lot of commonality there with the beautiful red landscape. So um, yeah, so there's there's so much exciting that's happening right now and, and will be happening in the future. So just in the science realm coming up just in the next month or so, we'll be launching the next great observatory, the, the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, so-called. Um, I will probably be hiding under a desk somewhere because it's kind of terrifying what it has to do. It launches actually from French Guiana because it's launching on a European rocket. And then it has to, it's going to be at um, at a Lagrange point, an Earth Sun Lagrange point with the Earth and Sun both behind it. So I think that's L2. I think I have that right. Um, and it's got because of it's so big it's all folded up like an origami that needs to unfold uh once it gets out um beyond earth and it is going it's an infrared telescope that's meant to be the sort of successor of hubble it's not exactly like hubble hubble being a visible light telescope visible in uv this is infrared but it's infrared for a reason hubble was launched to try to look at the very faintest stars, which we, as we know, those stars that are farthest away are kind of back in time. It's a way of looking back in time. And what we realized after we launched Hubble was, hey, there's stuff even beyond what Hubble can see. And it's red shifted because of the expansion of the universe to an extent that um, we need an infrared telescope to see, you know, sort of the very first stars, the very first stars, the very first galaxies. And so that's what James Webb Space Telescope, that's one of the main things it was designed to do, but it's going to do a whole bunch of other stuff too. look at stellar nurseries and exoplanets and all kinds of truly, truly amazing things. So that's exciting. Um, you know, Mars is going great with Perseverance now, the sort of daughter of, of curiosity, if you will, um, roaming around Jezero Crater, uh, exploring that and also excitingly drilling and storing um, sample cores to hopefully finally get to bring those samples back to earth. And again, hearkening back to 1996, when you know I get the call from the JPL Mars program, like, Lori, can you come help us think about Mars sample return? Okay, sure, I'll be there tomorrow. And we we sort of replanned the Mars program and tried at that time to pitch Mars sample return. That was 1996. They had pitched it right after Viking as well. So it's literally been, it's it, Mars sample return, we joke, has been 10 years away for like 40 years, I think. But it finally feels like it really is 10 years away now. And so JPL is doing great work um, along with the Europeans and getting ready to send a lander with a, with a rocket on it to go retrieve the samples that Perseverance is collecting launch that rocket off the surface of Mars, then you got to grab it with an orbiter in space and you got to break the whole chain of contamination for planetary protection reasons, which is a whole other long conversation, and then bring that back to Earth for analysis in, in great Earth-based labs. Now, I will say that um, it, there are many things we can do with rovers on the surface of Mars. And I have personally done, you know, had great scientific experiences with Curiosity doing a quite frankly similar experiment to the one I used to do in the lab under the stairs, scooping up Mars stuff, putting it in an oven, heating it up and analyzing the stuff that, that came off. But we'll never be able to do any of that to the level of detail you can do in labs on Earth. The, the instruments that I used to work on in Earth-based labs, whether that was at UCLA or in my own lab at ASU, the whole the whole sensor was more was far larger than a whole Mars rover, right? Like we just the the sensitivity you can get in in labs on Earth just will far always far exceed what we can do remotely until we have you know big bases and stations and things. So very exciting to bring those rocks back and look for hopefully evidence of life, but also uh, probably ancient life preserved in the rocks. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is, and we can maybe talk more about this. So on the other side of the house, so the human space flight side uh, at NASA, extraordinarily exciting. One of the things we did when I was um, in exploration systems, my last job at NASA 10 years ago, was we started something called the commercial crew program, where it was, look, we know we're retiring the space shuttle. Let's invest in some of the private providers who can then, we can commercially purchase seats for our astronauts to do that few hundred miles up around and around the earth go to the space station so that nasa can stay focused on the frontier on sending on the rockets and capsules that will eventually take humans beyond low earth orbit to the moon and on to mars and that's exactly what we did and now just in this past year um year year and a half we're finally launching u.s astronauts from u.s soil but this time on those commercial rockets and it's been great as part of the daa 
process here to to share the award this year with Bob Benkin, commander of the first of those launches from US soil. So, so such a moment of pride to see that program finally really come to fruition and couldn't be more exciting time in the commercial space sector right now. There's so much happening from, you know, earth observing um, robotic satellites to uh, crewed missions to lots of talk about private space stations. Um, talk about private land where there'll be potentially privately, you know, commercial landers on the moon, uh, all this coming up in the next five years. So stay tuned. It's going to be an exciting ride. William Shatner, notwithstanding, although I'm <laughs> such a Star Trek fan. So exciting. No, right? no, I mean, I was sincerely thrilled. And that, that actually does answer. I just want to give it to Jason Serendolo, BSO9 Mechanical Engineering, Ricketts, um, who, who had asked what you've answered, what trends in space flight and space exploration you're excited about. And also, uh, here's a kind of a metaphysical one, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Cole, who majored in physics in 1980. So we were there at the same time in physics, probably we we're Phys 196 or whatever that we're probably faking our way through the same plat. Well, I did. Okay. Uh, he or she it could be a he or she ask why, uh, why is it hard to detect life? Well, this is a good question. It, it, it is. Um, so, you know, first of all, what I would say is, uh, you know, I think we, going all the way back to Viking, those first pictures that I saw when I was 10, you know, one of the experiments they did was they kept coming back and taking pictures to make sure none of the rocks moved, right? Like they, they were looking for locomotion and things like, like there was a team, there were people who were doing that and, you know, good on them because who the heck knows. So look, we, we would always love for something to, you know, crawl by the lander and that would be fairly straightforward as a, as a way of detecting. So there are certain um, life signs that are are relatively straightforward to detect, but but the truth is that um, most of the times we try and do this, and by the way, this is true for the early rock record on the Earth as well. It can be quite challenging to to definitively prove biogenic origin that, that is a, a life origin, and so um, actually, there's just a great paper if folks want to go look it up in Nature just a week or two ago, Jim Green, the NASA chief scientist, and a group of folks just put out a sort of a framework to think about how to validate the discovery of extraterrestrial life and that we probably ought to have a bit of a more of a kind of a rigorous scale like they have he compared it to the increasing technology readiness scale that we use to develop and mature technologies that eventually fly into space. Um, but I think the main reason it's hard is that that life is basically chemistry and physics, and there's a lot of things that can mimic that. And so in the absence of, of really obvious, clear biosignatures, you're often dealing with um, trace signatures that can be produced abiotically and that um, may, may or may not be in an environment that's obviously a habitable one. So understanding that broader environmental context is important. It's like all good scientific problems, as we were talking about earlier, it's pretty highly multidisciplinary, right? You need to, you need to come at it from a lot of different directions. And it's, it's an extraordinary claim, right? This was talked about a lot back in 1996 with the life in the Martian meteorite. Carl Sagan talked about extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And, and it will be an extraordinary claim when we claim the solid evidence of the first life from another world. So we need to make sure that we've put systems in place to enable us to, um, to, to generate that extraordinary evidence. It's one of the reasons Mars Sample Return is such an important mission. Because in the absence of that, I think it's, it's gonna be very hard to prove absent something crawling by the lander. <laughs> that, that's really, <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Well, what, uh, this is going up. What do you think, Lori? Do you think that we will see well, and life on Mars? I mean, yeah. So I'm I'm pretty optimistic that that life could have gotten started there. I mean, just when you look back at what Mars was like at the time that life started on Earth, it, we think it was much more Earth-like, right? There we have lots of evidence for flowing water and standing water. We have there's plenty of you know building blocks around all of the organic materials that were made from, and there's 
was plenty of good food, you know, plenty of energy sources, be it, you know, hydrothermal system heat or sunlight or other, you know, there were plenty of, plenty of good things to eat, lots of yummy rocks with good, um, you know, chemical energy to munch on if you're a little bug on Mars. So I think that ingredients were there and the question is, did we make the soup? And so that question, you have to find the right rocks to answer. And this is actually a hard thing on earth. If you said, find me, you know, for 3.8, 4 billion year old rocks on earth that show evidence of life, it's hard. Um, so they're off trying to find the right rocks to sample. And that's why all of the other experiments on perseverance are so important because they provide you that environmental context. So you can understand the rock that you're sampling um, and make sure it's one where we think it's possible that if there was life, it, it um, fossilized evidence would be preserved. Um, I think the more interesting question is if it got started, is it likely to be still there, perhaps deep under the surface where liquid water could um, and where you know conditions are better away from the radiation environment at the surface? don't have a lot of evidence that that's the case, but it would not necessarily be all that easy to figure out. So I think there's no shortage of great science still to be done on Mars. We're still, after all these years of exploring, just really scratching the surface of this extraordinary world that frankly it has a landmass equivalent to the you know above sea level landmass on the earth, right? Imagine that we'd only been able to visit earth in just a few places. There's so much more that we, we have to learn about Mars as a planet and lots of other really interesting places to go to like Europa where one of the next big JPL missions is going to try and get a handle on these uh, oceans and, and see what's the nature of this ice on the surface. And it's gonna be really exciting to see that too. Fascinating and, and and good things that like comparing Earth and Mars for students to think about of kind of like if you only had you know evidence of rocks, how would you find I mean it, how how would you find evidence of life? That that is really such very a great puzzle, right? And and it's uh and it's lots and lots of and it's so interestingly, right? That this was this is the best legacy of the life in a Mars meteorite from the mid-90s is that now so many more people are having those conversations. And, and now even those biosignature conversations extend to looking at planets beyond our solar system, right? Mars is right next door, so that's great. We get to go there. And oh, by the way, Venus is pretty interesting too. And we're going there finally again uh, as, as a nation as well, but um, very different uh, kind of environment there on Venus. But, but all these planets around other stars also hold that potential. And so that's an even harder problem, trying to think about how to detect biosignatures from a very long distance remotely. So back for our overall question, once again, this is from Peter Cross, BS 1967 Biology and Caltech Alumni Association member since 2018. Yay. Um, I guess kind of looking back, well, and forward, it's you're not done by any means over your successful career. What do you consider, and I think that's a, always an interesting question from the Caltech community of fellows and sister and sibling scientists. What do you consider the most important skills you learned in grade school and in college to sustain this, this incredibly rich career that you've had? Um, yeah, good question. I, I, I think the most important skill that I learned and, and have kept feeding is just a desire to learn new things. That That is the thing that has probably served me the best. I, I very much remember my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Lee, um, who was the first teacher I had who really kind of taught, like treated us like people with brains who could think and reason. And, and we talked about all kinds of stuff from, you know, complex science to the Cuban Missile Crisis and whatever else was, was happening in the world. And and it, he just really helped me get in touch with my curiosity. And it has always stayed with me. And I remember when I gave up sort of being a day-to-day -day bench scientist to go join NASA, get, being so excited as running a, a, a science organization that did everything from, you know, black holes to climate change. So all the way from, you know, hardcore astrophysics to to climate science and then, you know, heliophysics and planetary science, my own discipline, but things in space beyond my own expertise and just getting to dive in and learn kind of 
okay, you know, teach me about X-ray astronomy. I don't really know. I study rocks on Mars, you know, and, and, or teach me about, you know, how we're, how we're thinking about the latest climate modeling and, um, and, you know, I, the retreating ice sheets or whatever it was that we were working on at Goddard. And, and I just, I love that. And I loved it when I came to WPI and getting to learn all the different, you know, disciplines here and, and seeing what our students are interested in. You know, we launched uh, the first in the nation robotics engineering degree, a truly interdisciplinary degree. Well, you know, 500 students studying robotics engineering here. What are they doing? How are they? What, what's the latest technology? What are they working on? And just that curiosity, always asking that next question, I think has served me, um, has served me well. One of my VPs here, my VP of student affairs likes to joke that, um, that he, he said to me about a year in as president, he said, okay, I figured you out. You, uh, you approach everything like a scientist, uh, that everything to you is a hypothesis to be tested. And I realized, you know, yes, that, that does date back to, to grade school, high school and college, but really that's probably the Caltech training kicking in there, which is that you kind of build models of the world in your head and then you're always testing things to see whether they fit your model or whether you need to update your model. Um, and uh, and it's like, yeah, that's true. So I kind of happily own that. Well, or it's a combo platter because you, you, you were questioning your father, Steve Leshen, when he <laughs> yeah. said everyone took a rock at age eight. So maybe like a combo platter that yeah. found Caltech, <laughs> Caltech found you, you're very, very much um, uh, of that family training. Um, I, I think that, it, it, you know, thinking about your journey, your great teachers that you had that inspired you, and, and then that you know, you're president of a great university. Um, there are a, a, a question from Jay Kalea, if I'm correct, BS 1980, Applied Physics, Page. Page, we were in the same dining hall at the same time, must have been, all right. Um, and I think this, you know, this definitely comes up in terms of something that you're talking about with, with students and learning. Uh, the question is, do Caltech and WPI, it, your thoughts, have any joint efforts aimed at diversity and or student mental health, which kind of comes yeah. back to that experience of firing those those young people and and advice that you yeah. yeah, Yeah, and also comes back to the question about, you know, what's the biggest challenge universities face? I think student mental health is definitely up there right now. I can talk a little more about that. So the answer is we don't have any directly joint programs, although, Tom, if you're still on, I'm always open to talking about that. Um, but but we are all part of organizations that are working collaboratively together on, especially those two issues, diversity and student mental health, are two that um, are coming up a lot. I just did a, finished a turn as um, president chair, whatever it's called, of the Association of Independent Technological Universities, AITU. So independent means private universities, technological. So these are all of the private STEM schools. And Caltech is a member, actually, and, um, and it's a great group of, of technological institutions. And we, uh, one, of, one of the lasting, I would say, benefits, if there is one, of COVID is that all of the colleges are talking to each other much, much more and collaborating much, much more than we ever have before because we were all sharing best practices, leaning on each other, learning from each other. Is this working for you? What's working for you? So both in Massachusetts across private higher ed and also across these technological institutions which span the nation, I've gotten much closer to lots of other presidents at other institutions. And so we ask ourselves maybe six, nine months ago, okay, now we've built these strong relationships. What, what else are we gonna do with that? And, and, and those issues of, of increasing diversity in STEM um, or, or diversity at all our institutions actually, um, and making sure that we really are representing our nation and um, it, uh, you know, with the students that we're educating. And then also student mental health issues are really vexing. And, and I'll just say a, a little thing about that. I mean, we've uh, seen um, based on national studies, which WPI is not uh, any different from, and I'm sure Caltech isn't either, just a massive increase in um, rates of anxiety and depression and suicidality among college age um, young people, not only those in college overall, but but those in college as well, it's almost doubled in six years, which is shocking. And so that number is about the, the percentage of students who would report anxiety or depression. Um, and I think that's diagnosed, uh, it's like 40%. So almost one in two now. And certainly the, the pandemic itself has um, presented a lot of real challenges 
to young people who lost a year and a half of their social development at the most essential time in their development, you could argue, into adults. And, and we're seeing the stressors of that kind of burn through at the moment. And so I do think as college leaders, it's one of the most important things that we need to do going forward is share evidence-based practices. There are not, it's not as much of that as you would hope. Um, we need to be thinking beyond the traditional college counseling center model. We've got to go way upstream from that and have interventions about wellness and resilience and thriving that are for all students before they show up clinically so that we can um, really continue to advance the education because you can't, your brain can't learn stuff when you're stressed to a breaking point. And so it's, it's a scary moment actually. And we've, we've certainly suffered some losses at WPI that are, are challenging and we're, um, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can think of to try to help support these students while, you know, increasing their resilience so that they can do the hard work of, of changing the world for the better, which is what they want. That's why they're here. Well, although it's challenging hearing you speak, it certainly gives hope um, that mom hugs included, that this is going to all work out. And I just sure, wanted we had to- moms, Yeah, we had moms <laughs> at our fountain giving mom hugs the other day. It was the best, <laughs> I got one, I have to tell you, it was fantastic. <laughs> and I, I think I, I will give the last word on what we've talked about to E. William Cole Glazier, uh, yeah, BS66. Yeah. Page, PhD, page, strong today. Well, we love all the other houses, including Fleming. That's all in the past. Any, any. <laughs> no uh, comment. PhD, physics, who said, uh, Bill said, and to you and, and your father uh, too, wonderful, engaging, inspiring talk showing the excitement of doing science. And I think you're right. It, like, as you've said, scientists are not passionless. Right. It's the passionate, passionate pursuit of knowledge, not the passionless. That's right. I have seen scientists and engineers cry in mission control. This is not a passionless pursuit. It's a passionate pursuit. And that's, um, this was on the Hubble servicing mission. I don't probably have time to tell the whole story, but it was, uh, you know, together and especially, you know, individuals achieve great things, but together and collectively, it's one of the most exciting things about being involved in space exploration is it takes a, a huge team to do these amazing things, these mighty things and, and being, having a career where I've been able to be a part of that and then be a part of some amazing STEM institutions is, is truly an honor and gosh, getting this award is just amazing too. So thank you. Well, Caltech is su super proud. I, I can't speak on behalf of our president, but I know Caltech is super proud to count you as, as, as one of, one of Caltech's own. So thank you so much for chatting with us today. The time has just flown. President Lori Leshen, um, Caltech Distinguished Alumna 2021. Um, thank you so much. Uh, next is another colleague of yours on December 1st, Wednesday, Dr. Charles Elachi, longtime director of JPL. Yeah, there's a link in the chat to click on if you want to register. Um, and also be thinking of your own nominations for distinguished alumni. Um, the deadline for that is January 23rd, whether you'll get an extension is, is as Caltechians, you know, we'll let you know, but, um, and so is January 23rd is the uh, deadline for that and watch your email inbox for for the um, ability to nominate. So this is Sandra Tinglow signing off. Remember Caltech's motto, the truth shall make you free. <laughs>